A new report by Stanford researchers suggests lockdowns have no significant benefits when it comes to stopping the spread of COVID-19. It's in a time we listen to the science and end this destructive policy. Friends, it's time for Hold the Line. Welcome to Hold the Line, I'm Buck Sexton. What many of us have suspected for months has now finally been confirmed by researchers from Stanford University. COVID lockdowns, based on the data, have no appreciable impact on the spread of the virus versus places that take more standard, individualized precautions. According to Newsweek, the peer-reviewed study compared the growth of coronavirus cases in countries that implemented mandatory lockdown orders and business closures, countries like Germany, Spain, and the U.S., to countries that implemented less severe restrictions, including Sweden and South Korea. As Newsweek reports, uh, quote, the researchers determined that there is no clear, significant, beneficial effect of more restrictive measures on case growth in any country. Oh, wow. You don't say. The news comes as some Democratic governor and big city, uh, governors and big city mayors seem increasingly eager to reopen businesses. During a press conference yesterday, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot expressed her desire to reopen the city's bars and restaurants. I am very, very focused on getting our restaurants re reopened. If we look at um, the various uh, criteria that the state has set, we are uh, meeting uh, most, if not all of those. So that's a conversation uh, that I will have with the governor, but I want to get our restaurants and our bars reopened as quickly as possible. I feel very strongly that we are very close to a point where we should be talking about opening up our bars and restaurants. Close to a point where we should be talking about opening up bars and restaurants. Okay. Why is this all happening right now? Let, let's start with something that I think we need to establish. There are a lot of factors here. This is a very complicated problem. Pandemics hit the whole world, hit the U.S. very badly. There are a lot of, lot of situations, a lot of problems that are playing out right now but they're coming together at this point in time. Let's take a look at this. We have the vaccine rollout, but so far the rollout has actually been poor. They haven't done a good job distributing this, nowhere near the numbers that were expected. So that's one issue, but the vaccine is getting rolled out and that's going to help. We're also about halfway through the winter, so the toll of the lockdowns is becoming uh, more apparent to people. Right? We're, we're right in the teeth of winter now in this country and we're seeing what all the damage is from it. So. That helps with awareness, for sure, of, of the drawbacks. Remember, lo the, the difference, or rather the, the choices here are not just government-mandated uh, lockdown of businesses and even stay-at-home orders and the most extreme things, or everyone goes out and parties and doesn't care. No, it's should the government be making these determinations in such a sweeping fashion? Is it worth the cost? for the benefit. That's the way we should have always been having this conversation. But because of the panic and the hysteria around this, that's not how it went. We had shutdowns. We had people saying that if you oppose the shutdowns, you are a bad person. But there's something else that's going on right now. And, and I think we should all be aware of it. This change in sentiment that's happening. And, and it's just the beginning of it. Let, let's be clear. It's the the tip of the spear, perhaps. There's not a huge chorus out there that wants to say this yet, but Governor Cuomo of New York. In fact, here, let's hear from the governor. We must plan our economic resurgence. We simply cannot stay closed until the vaccine hits critical mass. The cost is too high. We will have nothing left to open. We must reopen the economy, but we must do it smartly and safely. What does that even mean, smartly and safely? It means you're going to be making trade-offs, right? You have to, or else you're just going to stay closed, because why take any risk at all? Shouldn't that have been the approach all along? Take a look at what's going on right now with the three, uh, three of, I should say, the biggest states in the U.S., California, New York, and Florida. Uh, when, you, when you line these up, you see on, on a per capita basis the number of deaths, the number of cases, New York, Florida, California, Somehow, Calif uh, Florida continues to be doing much better than California or New York, despite the fact that Florida has, you guessed it, restaurants open, businesses open. The absence of lockdown in Florida is being proven to be a better policy. 
So we have the numbers for this, and this should have been clear for a long time, just the same way that schools should have been open. There was no good database reason to close schools when children are at so little risk themselves, and also very unlikely to pass it on to adults. But what else is happening right now? Oh, that's right. Joe Biden's $1.8 or $1.9 trillion reopening plan. Ah, you're starting to see how this all comes together. Now, they're going to use the reopening of America for very political purposes. And let's be clear, I want the country to reopen. I wish it had already been reopened, but they're going to do it slowly. And at every step of the way, you can expect that Biden and the Democrats will be levering this, uh, leveraging this for maximum political gain. What they're going to be doing is saying, you don't agree with the bailouts of, ci- of big blue cities with federal taxpayer dollars. You don't want us to reopen. You don't agree with a $15 minimum wage? What does that have to do with COVID? You don't want us to reopen. You stand in the way of the progress of the country toward normalcy. That's how they're going to set this up. Think about how politically potent that will be. Who's going to be able to come together with a movement that says, we're spending too much money on, it doesn't matter what you think they're spending too much money on, because they will immediately jump in and say, I'm sorry, do you not want Americans to get $2,000 checks in the mail? The great reopening is upon us. Now, they're going to do it slowly, and they're going to try to squeeze all of the best political juice out of this they can at every step. And then eventually we'll be getting closer to normalcy, but they can use this to steamroll the other side. Who even knows what's in this $1.9 trillion, $1.8, something, it's between the two, trillion dollar spending package? No one really dives deep into it. Here's what we do know. There's a lot of money for COVID relief, they say. There's $2,000 checks going out to a whole bunch of people. Who's really going to stop that right now? And if you try, and here's a prediction for you, if Republicans in the Senate decided to stand up, and I don't think they will, so that's my first prediction, they're going to get rolled on this. But even if they did say, no, it's too much money, too many pet projects, too many things that don't have to do with the actual reopening of America, but are much more about who Democrats feel like funding with your tax dollars, then what? They use the filibuster? Well, then the Democrats will just say, ah, we have to remove this. This shows you, look at those evil Republicans. This shows you why we can't allow a tyranny of the Republican minority in the Senate to stop money from getting to people, to stop our policies for testing and trace and all these other things that they're going to say, it'll be a giant grab bag of goodies. And anybody who says a word about it, the Democrats will point to and say, that person doesn't want to reopen. That person has a problem with the checks you're getting. Is it true? It doesn't matter. It's politics. And they know they can win on this one. So we need to be prepared for how this is going to play out. The pandemic began over a year ago. The world is still searching for answers as to where the disease came from. Um, Unfortunately, it seems that China is still less than willing to cooperate with the investigation. We've got our friend Gordon Chang when we come back. I got a crash course into home title theft, and you better pray this crime never happens to you because it can ruin you financially. Here's how the crime happens. The legal titles to our homes are kept online where they can be hacked. A cyber thief finds your home's title, forges your signature on a quit claim deed stating you sold your home to him. Then he takes out loans against your home until your equity is gone. You won't know about this usually until the collection calls pour in, perhaps even a foreclosure notice. Plus, you're not protected by insurance, your bank, or common identity theft programs. Home Title Lock, however, protects you. And in the unlikely event you become a victim of home title theft while a member, Home Title Lock will spend up to a quarter million dollars in legal fees to help restore your home's title. Go to HomeTitleLock.com and register your address to see if you're already a victim. Then use code RADIO for 30 free days of protection. That's code RADIO at HomeTitleLock.com. One more time, code RADIO at HomeTitleLock.com. It's been 13 months since the first case of COVID-19 was detected. Since then, more than 2 million people have died from the virus, including 389,000 Americans. Yesterday, the World Health Organization announced that they sent 13 scientists to Wuhan, China, to investigate the origins of the deadly disease. Was it from a wet market or a lab? The question has gone unanswered for almost a year now. So what are they going to find? 
Will China ever be held accountable? What would that even mean? And joining me now to discuss this is the author of The Coming Collapse of China, Gordon Chang. Gordon, good to see you. Good to see you, Buck. Thank you so much. So we know that China has pushed back. And, and just, just for everyone's context, the World Health Organization on January 14th of 2020, so almost exactly a year ago, tweeted out that the preliminary investigations conducted by the Chinese authorities have found no clear evidence of human-to-human -human transmission of the novel coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. We, we know that that's obviously a big lie, Gordon. Everyone's figured that one out. But now we have another uh, WHO team. Tell me what, what our expectations are for how it's going so far. I think the expectations are quite low. I mean, the WHO mission, which is actually the third to Wuhan, there were two, one in January, one in February last year, those were public relations exercises. And this one, although it's going to be longer, is, is really also just PR. I mean, they're going to be there a month, but two weeks are in quarantine. The terms of the mission were very heavily negotiated. They're not going to be able to do what they need to do, which is to stay there for a very long time and investigate talk to anyone, go anywhere, that's not, not going to happen. Gordon, also there's an outbreak right now in China. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, this outbreak is in the province that surrounds Beijing. And that means this is especially sensitive for the Chinese leaders. And so therefore they've locked down about 22 million people according to their reports, perhaps more. This is uh, going to be serious because they're going to hold in March um, their what they call the two meetings, the meetings of the National People's Congress and a Communist Party meeting of uh, consultants. Um, and if they have to postpone this year like they postponed last year, that will be, uh, I think, very embarrassing for the regime. So they're going all out to make sure that they can end this. But, you know, this bug is just resistant to measures that uh, we have been able to devise uh, as a human race. So I'm not so sure that China will be successful in, break, in containing this outbreak in just uh, Hubei province. And Gordon, China's pointed fingers at some other countries here trying to take some of the, the blame away from it in the international community. They say, for example, Italy was the origin or a place of origin for the virus when it first broke out. Well, what do we know about that? I mean, where are we in how, the certainty of where this came from before we even get into what specifically that means within those countries' borders. Yeah, we still have not discovered with certainty um, the origin of this outbreak. Um, there are many um, uh, theories, you know, and as you point out, China's pointed the finger to Italy, Spain, India, the United States, frozen food packaging, all the rest of it. Um, but clearly this is a disease which generated from Chinese soil. Um, it's interestingly, uh, Matt Pottinger, who was then deputy national security advisor, at the end of last month gave a briefing to British parliamentarians. And he said it was more likely than not that the source of this disease was the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is China's only P4 biosafety lab, which is very close to the wet market that many people first suspected. Um, you know, we're not going to really know unless the U.S. declassifies intelligence. The Trump administration has been declassing a lot, declassifying a lot of stuff in the last couple of days. They should also do this because we need to know where this disease came from. We have, uh, according to the South China Morning Post, Xi Jinping says the time and momentum is on China's side as he lays out his uh, Communist Party vision for, for his country. We know that uh, Gordon Biden is going to take office here in just a matter of days. What are going to be some of the first things we should expect from the, the Chinese side of, of this negotiation or ongoing relationship, I should say, with the U.S.? What's Xi Jinping going to try to do in what would effectively be a reset in his mind of his relationship with, uh, with the administration? My guess is that the Chinese are going to be extremely arrogant and they're going to try to push Biden around. Um, you pointed out to his uh, comments from the beginning of this week on Monday when he spoke to ministerial and provincial level um, cadres. And essentially what he said was the world is witnessing changes that have not been seen in a century. In other words, he was talking about the demise of the United States and the rise of China. So they're extremely arrogant right now. 
We know that they didn't test President Trump with a military provocation at the beginning of his term. I think that's because they were afraid of him, but they weren't afraid of George W. Bush or Barack Obama. We had incidents at the beginning of their terms. So we've got to be concerned that there will be some sort of incident at the beginning of Biden's term. I'm not saying it will occur. I'm saying that the US Armed Forces and indeed um, the United States needs to be prepared for some sort of incident in the next few months. Where, where would you suspect the most likely places are in the, in the US-China relationship for a, a flashpoint or a flare-up of some kind? It can be anywhere, Buck. Um, most people say South China Sea, Taiwan, could be Japan. There are Chinese troops now deep into Indian-controlled territory. You know, China's encroached on Bhutan and Nepal. Um, you know, China is really trying to expand its borders. So anywhere along China's periphery would be a, a candidate, but you never know because Beijing can strike anywhere. And we know that these guys can take us by surprise because they've done that in the past. And Gordon, if we're analyzing whether China has been able to leverage the COVID-19 pandemic to get a, a advantage over the U.S. in terms of the speed of coming out of this, the damage it's done to us and our economy and our society versus the damage it's done to China, how would, how would you assess that? Well, they've done very good on the economy. Um, so for instance, their exports are at record levels right now because they're exporting not only personal protective equipment, but also electronics, personal electronics, which are people are using because they're stuck at home in the US. So that they've done well, but internally their consumption is really very disappointing, which points to long-term weakness in the Chinese economy. And indeed, you know, Buck, a long term, a society is only going to recover from this if they've got safe and effective vaccines. The U.S. has two of them. China doesn't have a safe and effective vaccine. Their vaccines are testing at like 50 percent, 35 percent. Their protocols have been different for all their phase three trials. So China is well behind us in terms of vaccinations. And this is going to be critical, at least in the long term. Follow Gordon G. Chang on Twitter, everybody, for more analysis on what's going on around the world. Gordon, great to have you as always. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Buck. President-elect Joe Biden's pushing a $1.8 trillion COVID-19 relief package. We'll take a look at the details of the Biden plan in the Buck Brief. Fellow Patriots, MAGA CBD is a revolutionary American-made product that's safe for work, THC-free, and features patented NASA technology, making it the highest quality CBD oil on the market. They're dedicated to providing the purest, most effective products anywhere. So MAGA wants to give you third-party testing results from industry-leading experts. MAGA CBD is 100% committed to customer satisfaction and product quality. Best of all, 10% of proceeds go to veteran and first responder causes. Personally, MAGA CBDs really help me sleep through the night, which is something I've struggled with in the past. You can really feel and taste the difference with their apple pie flavored oil. What CBD product on the market could be more American? MAGA, NASA, apple pie. It's America at its finest. For your CBD needs, look no further than MAGA CBD. Learn more and order today at magacbd.org. Save 10% with promo code BUCK. That's MAGACBD.org, promo code BUCK. And so tonight, I'd like to talk to you about our way forward, a two-step plan of rescue and recovery, a two-step plan to build a bridge to the other side of the crisis we face to a better, stronger, more secure America. Tonight, I'll lay out my first step, the American Rescue Plan that will tackle the pandemic and get direct financial assistance and relief to Americans who need it the most. Next month, in my first appearance before a joint session of Congress, I will lay out my Build Back Better Recovery Plan. There you have it, folks. The new vision of Democratic leadership here, courtesy of Joe Biden. You got more spending, you got more regulating, you're gonna have a lot more government, that's for sure. So what exactly is new about this Biden stimulus plan? Large parts of it are, parts of it are directly stolen from ideas that President Trump had called for, but was of course prevented from getting by the Democrat-controlled Congress. When President Trump proposed it, it was dead on arrival, thanks Nancy Pelosi. 
President-elect Biden now supports it, and it's supposed to be revolutionary. Oh my gosh, a lot of spending that was blocked by Democrats while people suffered all across the country. Now that spending can happen because Biden is the president. The rest of the plan, by the way, is just the typical left-wing, throw money at the problem until it goes away style of governance. But let's examine this uh, stimulus point by point on today's Buck Brief. So as you can see here, this newly proposed Biden stimulus is just shy of a whopping $2 trillion, okay? Covers a whole host of items, from minimum wage to unemployment benefits to eviction moratoriums. You got a lot of things here. Okay, total stimulus, one, it's $1.9 trillion. Uh, $1,400 checks uh, plus the $600, $400 a week on employment. Uh, you're going to get $15 uh, minimum wage. What is that? Well, that's just something Democrats have always wanted. And let me say, that's popular. Polls always show that people want a higher minimum wage. Doesn't matter how many think tank pieces you show them, that also will undoubtedly be proven to be true in the sense that there'll be cutbacks in hours, cutbacks in certain jobs, but some people will get more money as a result of the $15 minimum wage, so they like it. 14 weeks of paid sick leave. Wow, um, I, I don't think I've ever been able to take 14 days off for anything. 14 weeks, though, of paid sick leave. $400 billion for vaccines and the fight against the pandemic, $130 billion for schools, 100,000 new healthcare workers and rent relief and an eviction ban. Uh, now this is going to be very expensive. That much is for sure, but we do have to face up to a problem here. Conservatives were not talking a whole lot about the spending that was going on for four years in the Trump administration. We spent heavily, went deeper into national, deeper into debt, the national debt grew considerably, and that also continued last year during the actual pandemic. Well, that means that we're going to have a tough time making the fiscal responsibility case during a time like this. And that's why Joe Biden knows the best way to get his way with all of it is to use that money and get it to people. And everyone's going to think that this is somehow a new and exciting idea. Here's Joe Biden on the checks. We will finish the job of getting a total of $2,000 in cash relief to people who need it the most. The $600 already appropriated is simply not enough. We just have to choose between paying rent and putting food on the table. Even for those who've kept their jobs, these checks are really important. They were also very important before the Georgia senatorial, uh, Senate races that were going on that we know now the GOP lost both of them and Mitch McConnell blocked those $2,000 uh, checks from going to people. That was foolish as we now see. The money is still going to get spent but I guess there are some people who at the, net, at the next uh, you know, think tank dinner can say, well I was a fiscal conservative even before we were about to get crushed and lose control of the Senate. So they've got that going for them which is nice. And Joe Biden is using this now as his opportunity. He has a pretty straightforward playbook to run. Trump got blocked on all this. Trump lost the election. And now Joe Biden gets to be the one who's going to be feeding the hungry. Play it. So we're going to extend emergency nutritional assistance for, 30, for 43 million children and their families enrolled in the SNAP program through the rest of this year. We'll help hard hit restaurants prepare meals for the hungry provide food for the families who need it. We will invest $3 billion in making sure mothers and their young children have the nutrition they need. This will not only meet our moral obligation we have to one another, but it will also spur our economic growth, get restaurants and workers back on the job. You'll notice that there is no discussion among Democrats right now of why the economy is in such bad shape. Uh, and certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has played a big role, but there's also the lockdowns that we've been talking about. And were they the best policy? Were they necessary? Now we're in a situation where it was Democrats mostly pushing for lockdowns across the country, the hardest measures to be sure. And they're saying, well, we're going to fix it. Well, one way to fix it, instead of just spending a whole lot of money, would be to stop forcing businesses to close and destroying small businesses in cities and, uh, and areas all across the country. That would also be a way to achieve a better, uh, a better economic situation for, for all of us. Um, and then there's just the 
greater long-term mission that Democrats are going to take on here of, that's right, the war on poverty continuing it. Here's Biden. Direct cash payments, extended unemployment insurance, rent relief, food assistance, keeping essential frontline workers on the job, aid to small businesses. These are the key elements to the American Rescue Plan that would lift 12 million Americans out of poverty and cut child poverty in half. That's 5 million children lifted out of poverty if we move. Never let a crisis go to waste. Remember how the Obama administration started? It came in during a financial crisis. Then there was a trillion dollars of, uh, of stimulus that went to a whole range of government expansions and a lot of, a lot of different insurance, uh, insurance programs for people who have lost their jobs, but, but also a whole lot of money getting to other things. Left-wing causes, Democrat pet projects. Uh, that's because if you opposed it, you opposed the recovery after the financial crash. If you oppose any of this, you will be demagogued with you don't want the country to recover or to reopen. So they have a very strong hand here. Right now, what Biden's talking about are things we could all agree on. Yeah, absolutely. Send checks to people who need it, who have lost their businesses or have lost their jobs because of the lockdowns. Make sure every American is fed. These are things that people will shake their heads and say, absolutely. There's going to be a whole lot more than that. This is just the beginning. This is what you're being told must be done before Biden even takes office officially. Once he gets in there, get ready to hear about how we have to spend billions, perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars to deal with the simultaneous climate emergency along with the COVID-19 emergency. Just as serious, that climate emergency. You heard it here first. More than 20,000 National Guardsmen are expected to be in D.C. in anticipation of President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration. We'll discuss the massive deployment of American troops to our nation's capital with author and former Navy SEAL sniper Brandon Webb when we come back. Friends, we have a new sponsor that I want to tell you about, Mammoth Nation. It's America's conservative discount club. Their mission is to fight for the conservative values and causes that we all care about. That includes conservative candidates, the police and first responders, active military and veterans, American farmers and ranchers, the Second Amendment, and a lot more. The proceeds from your membership and purchases help support all of these great causes. It's better than a donation. In return for your patriotism, you get great discounts on things like hotels, shopping, wireless, prescriptions, telehealth, and more. Spend your money where it counts. I'm a lifetime member. You should become a lifetime member too. Join the fight today. This is a great program and a great deal. Go to mammothnation.com slash buck. That's mammothnation.com slash buck. Great deals and causes that you care about. This is all around something you should check out. Become a lifetime member today. mammothnation.com slash buck. We have about 6,000 troops on the ground now um, from states nearby uh, the district, Maryland and Virginia, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Delaware. Uh, and we understand that the Army will make up to 15,000 available to respond to the request from the Capitol, our request, and all of the federal uh, facilities in the district. Latest numbers are that more than 20,000 National Guard soldiers are expected to be in D.C. before President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration next week, exceeding the number of troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria combined. They're bringing rifles and full-on battle gear. The troops flowed in from seven states, turning the U.S. Capitol into what looks like a military staging ground. But the streets of D.C. this January look a lot different than they did four years ago. Here's a reminder how the left acted in the days leading up to Trump's inauguration. That was our nation's capital in the inauguration the last time around. Where was the forceful and very visible warning to troublemakers then? Here to discuss what's going on in our nation's capital is New York Times bestselling author and former Navy SEAL, Brandon Webb. Brandon, good to see you. Yeah, same. Uh, Mike, Mike Pence, Vice President Pence, has said this. He spoke to some National Guard soldiers. Play it. We are committed to an orderly transition uh, and to a safe inauguration. 
and the American people deserve nothing less. And I'm looking forward today to hear about the efforts uh, for deploying the full resources of the federal government to ensure that both of those occur. That was at a press conference, actually, but he also spoke directly to National Guard about the same issue, Brandon, saying that there's going to have to, there's going to be an orderly transition here. What do you make of the, the massive military presence in D.C. for the inauguration? Well, I think it shows that we're in kind of unprecedented times. I mean, we've had issues in the past, right, where the Puerto Rican separatists fired on the Capitol. We have plenty of incidents, but I, I think this really caught um, D.C. by surprise this last time. I mean, you, you have people in the chamber, that guy with the crazy uh, Viking hat. Um, I mean, people generally fearing politicians, fearing for their lives, and it, we're in unprecedented times. I, I think we have one of the largest income gaps uh, in America that we've ever seen. We have an incredible recession looming on the horizon that really hasn't seemed like it, it it's hit yet and been real for people. Um, so I, I think stand by for more civil unrest. And what, what do you think of, of the, the images that we see as well of people, uh, National Guard members, sleeping on the floor of the Capitol? I mean, they, they're, they're really, here, here you go, you see it on the screen. Uh, one gets the sense that, that they're preparing for an invasion. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I think we're seeing how, how the media is, is uh, on the liberal side is, is very biased towards certain candidates, right? And uh, uh, this, to me, is an attempt to kind of show force. But, you know, as somebody that's served in the military and, and with your background as well, you know that the, most of these National Guard troops are reservists. They're what we jokingly call weekend warriors in the, in the military for the, the active duty guys. Um, I just can't see um, a 19 year old picking up an assault rifle and being being willing to point it at a, another but, American. But is that, so but Brandon, is that even really why you think they're deploying them? Or is this, just, you know, are, are they trying to make a point by, by having so many soldiers, it seems to raise the tension to the point where, well, this must be necessary. And, and obviously because of what happened at the Capitol, but is it really necessary? I mean, does, does anyone think that h hundreds of people heavily armed are going to uh, do something terrible? Because it, 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 it looks like that's what they're preparing for. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I mean, you make a good point, right? So uh, I, is it really necessary? Pro probably not. Um, is it, does it look like this knee-jerk reaction? Yeah, especially you know, the, the drum beating for Trump's second impeachment. And it just seems like um, we're throwing, um, the, the left is really throwing um, gasoline on, on a fire that, that really doesn't need it. It's a smoldering fire at best. So everything is peaceful and comes off exactly as it's supposed to be here with this transition. Brandon, good to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks, Mark. After the break, some uh, rapid fire takes on the stories we didn't quite get to in tonight's quick hits. These days, being prepared for the unknown is more important than ever. I'm sure you've noticed the world we live in is anything but predictable. We could all benefit from something reliable right about now. Well, what could be more reliable than real gold and silver? I'm talking about real gold and silver you can actually hold right in your hands. Call the Oxford Gold Group and learn how easy it is to get real gold and silver sent securely directly to your home or how you can have real gold and silver placed in your IRA or 401k. Just call the Oxford Gold Group at 833-600-GOLD and ask for your free guide on owning gold and silver. Again, call the Oxford Gold Group right now at 833-600-GOLD. The Oxford Gold Group is the only gold company I trust. Call them right now at 833-600-GOLD. One more time, that's 833-600-G-O-L-D. Don't wait for inflation to kick up right now. You need to make sure you're preparing for the future. Check out the Oxford Gold Group today. It's who I get my gold and silver from, 833-600-G-O-L-D. A congresswoman claims not wearing a mask is like chemical warfare, and Harvard students want to retroactively withdraw degrees from conservative graduates. Let's take a look at some of the stories we haven't gotten to yet in tonight's Quick Hits. Let's start with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. So she is uh, somebody that has become well-known because of her association in what is known as the Squad, the progressive 
uh, all-female group of legislators, Democrats, who are quite left-wing, and uh, she's, she's one of them, along with Rashida Tlaib, and of course AOC, and she said this. Now, you have to remember, there was a shelter-in-place period, or a, a shelter in a, uh, a secure location at the Capitol during the terrible Capitol Hill riot, but one of the problems that we've heard about now from, from Democrats is that they said some of their Republican colleagues were unwilling to mask up during this. So they're indoors, they weren't masking up. Now, out of you know, politeness, people can argue whether they think they should have or shouldn't have, uh, shouldn't have. Uh, but Representative Presley here took it a whole step further. Listen to what she accused her colleagues of doing. These, these folks, I mean, they're just, um, it's criminal behavior, Don. I, I don't know what else to call it. Um, they have been complicit from the very beginning in uh, their willful criminality to carry the water for Donald Trump and these science denials, which allowed this pandemic to rage out of control. And then by refusing to wear masks, um, I, I, this is criminal behavior. That's chemical warfare, so far as I'm concerned. Interesting that she's citing science there and then talking about chemical warfare. My understanding is that as it's a virus, it would probably be biological warfare. So if we're going to be getting into specifics, I think, and talking about science, we should at least get the basics right. Um, but even still, to call it biological warfare is crazy, and we all know that, right? These are people who don't have any reason to believe that these members of Congress, that they actually have COVID and the chance of getting COVID from a short-term exposure in a, in a space, albeit enclosed, is not particularly high. And even if one were to get COVID, we know that overall the uh, survivability of COVID is over 99%. So if this were biological warfare, as the Congresswoman claims, it would be the least effective biological warfare mechanism anybody's ever seen. But I know she said chemical warfare, but the same ideas basically apply. But for, in, in many ways, the more troubling part of this is her blaming Republican members of Congress for the pandemic raging out of control. I would like Congresswoman, Press, uh, Congresswoman Presley to pick up a newspaper and look at what is happening in, in the UK, in Germany, in Spain, in France, in Brazil, and now in China. Look at all these countries. Well, somehow in this country, it's all Donald Trump's fault and Republicans' fault that there's been this pandemic that we have not been able to control when nobody should have thought that mask up and wash your hands, as Fauci tells us, was going to be enough to stop this thing? Not even close. But they blame their fellow Republicans for it. It's disgraceful. Um, and then you've got uh, Congressman David, uh, uh, D David Cicciolini. I hope I got that one right. Um, who did this. He sneezed into his hand during the impeachment, during the impeachment vote. But this is, that's, that, there you go. Pull off your mask to sneeze or cough. That's, that's what you get. There you have it. That's the real, that's the science right there. But see, this is what I mean. You know, the one, the, the, probably the highest risk of spread of this, if you happen to have COVID, would be coughing or sneezing into a room full of people. And you're supposed to wear a mask to protect. So you pull the mask down and you do that. Does anybody else see how increasingly absurd this whole thing is getting now. Can we just all be adults about this? Terrible virus, the virus gonna virus, bad things are gonna happen, and we can't stop it. Anyone who says we're gonna stop it is lying to you or ignorant. There is no, no one has been able to do that. Unless you're on a tiny island and you can shut yourself off from the rest of the world, like perhaps New Zealand. Uh, then there's this, Harvard. Very fancy school, we all know it. Uh, Harvard wants to revoke Republican degrees. Here's what they said. Following last year's effort to ban Trump administration officials from speaking on campus, Harvard University uh, now has students circulating a petition that calls for revoking degrees from Trump supporters and aides who attended the elite Ivy League institution. The reason cited, according to a copy of the petition, a petition is that supporters of President Trump were involved in spreading disinformation and mistrust that led to last week's deadly ride at the Capitol building. Let me just say that this shows you the degree to which the left really thinks that they, they own these institutions. They'll do whatever they want them to do. 
And if that means they have to be weaponized completely apart from the actual purpose of the institution for political reasons, they're all for it. You may have seen that earlier this week, Politico, which is left-wing, allowed conservative commentator and author Ben Shapiro to write their Politico playbook. Now, they also allowed, I think it was Chris Hayes from MSNBC to write up the day before, so they were going to do a left and right perspective. Pretty straightforward stuff. They had to have a 200 plus person Politico employee Zoom cry session because, oh my gosh, Ben Shapiro wrote something for us. Now, this is great press if you're a conservative, by the way. Please, left wing outlet, let me write for your crappy publication or website so that then everyone can freak out. Oh my gosh, this conservative. And I get to be the one that says, oh, I'm just sharing my thoughts. This is great. It makes the left look like the bunch of loons that they are, though. And it also shows you that they're activists, not journalists. Because why would they care so much? What's the big problem here? What's the big issue with having a conservative right? What's the big problem with having people with Harvard degrees out there who disagree with your politics? But they're they're not... They're not... uh, They're not training generations and generations here at these elite universities of leaders who can think for themselves, that's for sure. A lot of wokeness and social justice, people that knew how to play the system to get into one of these places, and then usually don't do very impressive stuff uh, when they're there. And then you have Andrew Yang here in New York City. Now, Yang is a Democrat. He's really almost a Democrat socialist. I don't even know if he calls himself a socialist, but he's a pretty likable guy. I've I've interviewed Andrew Yang before. He's a nice nice enough guy. Uh, but he is going to run for mayor in New York City. Now, he's getting all this heat because he said that he supports bodegas, and then people said, well, he's not in a bodega. We've got... Bodega, by the way, is like a Spanish grocery store. They're very common here in New York City. Uh, You know, deli is short for delicatessen. Bodega is a Spanish grocery store. Same kind of idea. Here you go. Back to, the, back to the champions from Green Cheese, a banana. How you doing, bro? A banana, pretty healthy. Everyone, you gotta. I'll buy the whole bunch. All right. I mean, why is that not a bodega? I live in New York City. Kind of looks like a bodega. I mean, some bodegas have a different uh, vibe than others, but that's actually, a lot of bodegas look like, I don't know, everyone's giving them a hard time. Yang would be a lot better than de Blasio, but then again, so would a piece of wood um, because de Blasio is the worst mayor in the country. That's it for tonight's Hold the Line. The No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly is up next. Have a great weekend, everybody. Shields high.